But you have six good years from age 10 to age 16 to be inspired to have a thrill of a lifetime contemplating the fact that you can understand the nature of physical reality itself. Bob and I are from Mad Science of Minnesota, which is a group that brings science enrichment into schools and targets elementary school age children to get them excited about science. And I'm wondering if there's some elementary children out there who are interested in pursuing theoretical physics. What should they be looking at? What should they be reading? Where should they be going to prepare themselves to really have a leg up on the next 20 years? Well, when I was eight years old, something happening which something happened which changed my life one thing is that albert einstein died many people remember the instant when princess diana died well for me it was the time when einstein died everyone was talking about the fact that he could not finish his greatest work and on the newspaper they published a picture of his desk with the unfinished work and so i thought to myself that's for me i'm going to help complete that dream of albert einstein so if you're a young kid out there, you have to have inspiration, and it all happens around the age of 10. Before then, it's all mommy and daddy, mommy and daddy. After age 10, you want to know what's out there. How big is the universe anyway? And that's where a telescope, a chemistry kit, a visit to the planetarium can make all the difference. Because that wonderment propels you to become a scientist. And then when you're 16 years of age, it's all over because peer pressure sets in, hormones <coughs> set in, people call you a geek, but you have six good years from age 10 to age 16 to be inspired, to have a thrill of a lifetime contemplating the fact that you can understand the nature of physical reality itself. That's a thrill of a lifetime, and it keeps me going every day. <laughs> Are we ever gonna harness lightning? Lightning? There's a huge That's amount hard. of energy there. <laughs> yeah, but it's raw. Yeah. <laughs> it's very uncontrolled. And uh, it's unpredictable. You can't bring it down when you want to. It's like a physicist relying on cosmic rays. Cosmic rays can produce more energy than a particle accelerator, larger than the Large Hadron Collider. But it's unpredictable. You can't control it. And it's very difficult to make measurements or experiments on a reproducible basis. That's why a particle accelerator is preferred over cosmic rays. And that's why lightning bolts are still a black box. We still know very little about lightning bolts as a consequence. Do you think that the afterlife exists in hyperspace? Well, a hundred years ago, there were some very serious theologians who said that God and spirits must exist in higher dimensions because then they could be everywhere and nowhere. They could be right in our room, hovering above us. Even H.G. Wells talked about this. H.G. Wells talked about the fourth dimension hovering right above the third dimension, and that's where the invisible man lives. The invisible man is invisible, not because he's a ghost, but because he hovers above us and light goes underneath him Therefore, he becomes invisible. And in fact, H.G. Uh, Wells even wrote a short story where two dimensions actually intersect, and an angel falls from one universe into our universe, where a clergyman accidentally shoots him with a shotgun. And so if there are spirits, uh, we have to be careful not to shoot them if they accidentally enter into our dimension. <laughs> so if beings existed in another dimension, then they would have the power of spirits. That is, they'd be able to walk through walls, they'd be able to disappear, reappear, in the same way that when we look at fish in a pond, we have the power of a ghost. If we look down on a pond, a very shallow pond of fish, we can disappear into the pond, reappear into the pond, grab fish, lift them out, put them back. We would have the power of a ghost being in the third dimension, looking down on the second dimension. However, from a physics point of view, we believe that even though our world could be 11-dimensional, 
That's the latest theory. Our universe is a three-dimensional bubble floating in an 11-dimensional ocean, and we're stuck like flies on flypaper, so we cannot leave our three-dimensional bubble. So there could be other bubbles out there. They would essentially be like a ghost to us. In fact, some people think that dark matter is like a ghost-like substance. Some people think that dark matter is ordinary matter that hovers above us in the fourth spatial dimension. In fact, one of my students has written papers on the subject saying that dark matter would be ordinary matter hovering above us, and it would be invisible like the invisible man. Well, what is that? Something that has mass but is invisible. That's exactly dark matter. And so there is a theory which says that dark matter is ordinary matter hovering above us like a ghost in hyperspace. You talked about invisible clothing that you could put on and you would not be able to be seen, which would be very nice if you were a, an army officer out in the field and the enemy wouldn't be able to spot you. Or a bank robber. <laughs> or a bank <laughs> or robber. A bank robber. <laughs> you might want to have a control on it. <laughs> right. Or, or, or a 16-year-old coming home late from a party. Well, the invisibility work? cloak is coming faster than you think. We already have perfected it for microwave radiation, but microwave wave radiation has a large wavelength about the size of your thumb. We want to get it down to the size of a wavelength of light, and that's quite difficult. You have to use nanotechnology. But just like water wraps around you and reforms at the other end, making you invisible to someone downstream, light can also behave like that. We once thought that was impossible. We once thought that the so-called index of refraction was always greater than one. Now we realize that's wrong. We can actually make the index of refraction less than one, in fact, even negative, so that light, in fact, can wrap around you, reform at the other end, so Harry Potter would be inside. So think of Harry Potter inside a cylinder. Light hits the cylinder, wraps around the cylinder, reforms at the other end, and Harry Potter is invisible inside the cylinder. Well, guess who's funding this research on metamaterials? The military. They're not stupid. <laughs> They've spent billions on stealth technology, and stealth bombers are not even invisible. You can see them, for God's sake. Look, uh, look at Pakistan right now. That was a stealth helicopter. You can see that stealth helicopter. In the future, we might be able to make a stealth helicopter that is truly invisible, but not yet. Nanotechnology is not yet at the stage where we can create metamaterials at will. Right now, we're talking about tiny, tiny microscopic quantities of metamaterials that indeed can make an object invisible if it's microscopic. Well, Dr. Kaku, it was great to talk with you. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your evening. Um, and I just want to mention at the end that you're coming to us by Skype, which five years ago was merely a pipe dream. So if there's anything that says that this can be possible, it's the fact that we're talking with you today. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. All right. Thank you.